And for this, we'll go to a world expert on sea level rise, Professor Morner from Sweden. This is a list of his qualifications. He's even been given awards for his contribution to sea level science. He has publicly slammed the so-called scientists, the alarmists, for the way they operate, almost like a mafia in suppressing opposition. As he explains here, you're not allowed to go against the consensus. And I repeat, that is not science. The alarmists even organize a blacklist, the antithesis of science. Now here's a little question before you go any further. Are the seas throughout the world just finding their own level? So basically you have the same mean sea level, allowing for tides, etc. throughout the world. The emphatic answer to that question is no. There are major variations in sea levels throughout the world because of the spinning of the earth, because of geological factors, etc. Enormous variations. But here's an interesting fact. Just with the Gulf Stream, which carries more water than all the rivers of the world combined, in that Gulf Stream, the centre can be five metres higher than the edges. Professor Morner studies the science in the field. He measures the sea levels. He looks at the coastal erosion. He looks at the continental plates moving below the sea. He examines all the physical factors to determine the history of sea level and therefore predict its future. To do this, he splits the factors into three main groups, as shown here. As you go into the science of this, you find out that the actual satellite telemetry shows no significant rise at all in the world's sea levels. The Enzo event shown in this graph is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and it's a periodic thing that happens, and it's well understood. But after that, the sea level returned to normal, with no trend at all. So what is Professor Morner's conclusion? Well, his conclusion is that sea level may be rising up to one millimetre a year, which is a centimetre every 10 years, or 10 centimetres in a 100 years. And that's as we come out of the mini ice age. As we deal with all the failed climatist alarmist predictions, I think it's important to understand the techniques they use to deceive you. And so we're now going to turn to that, because this gives a background to explaining how you're being fooled. And we will start with the starting date con. Just imagine that this pattern here, this wave, is a cycle of rainfall or temperature or any weather event. And say there was a cycle, just pretending for the moment, and that cycle kept repeating itself like this wave does. Well, what would happen if you just took a part of the wave, and in that part of the wave you cut it off at the lowest point and then showed just the part coming up and then gave a scare story on, wow, things are happening, things are increasing. That would be a very distorted picture because you're just showing part of the curve. Well, that's one of the tricks the alarmists do. And they choose different starting dates depending on the subject they're following. To explain this, I've taken a section from probably the best climate change site on YouTube, and that's Tony Heller. I'll hand over to him to show how this con is practiced on this particular one, Arctic sea ice. Hello, this is Tony Heller from realclimatescience.com. The climate science guy setting the record straight about climate. In this video, I asked the question, is Arctic sea ice actually disappearing as NOAA shows in this graph? The graph shows that Arctic September sea ice extent has declined about 30% since 1979, and Arctic March sea ice extent has also declined since 1979. So the question is, why did they start the graph in 1979? What they say on their website is that's the beginning of the satellite era, but I'm not so sure about that. This graph is from the 1990 IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it shows NOAA satellite data going back to 1974. Note that NOAA starts their current graphs right at this peak in 1979 and leaves off all the data prior to that, which was much lower. Why do they do that? Well, the reason why they do this is simple. 
By starting their graphs in 1979, right at the peak, they can show a linear downward trend which gets blamed on carbon dioxide. But if they started their graph when their data actually begins in 1974, then it would look like a cycle which goes up for a while and then comes down for a while, and that doesn't correlate very well with carbon dioxide. This story already looks bad for NOAA, but it gets much worse. There was another report written in 1985 by the Department of Energy titled Projecting the Climatic Effects of Increasing Carbon Dioxide. This was done by a study group who was the predecessor to the IPCC, and they showed Arctic sea ice data going all the way back to 1925, when it was high, then it declined to about 1955, rose again to 1965, and declined again to about 1974, when the IPCC data began from the 1990 report. It shows cyclical behavior rather than linear, and no correlation with carbon dioxide. So what happens if we merge the 1985 DOE graph and the 1990 IPCC graph? Well, let's try it and find out. I'm bringing the two graphs together at the same scale on both axes. This merged graph looks even more cyclical and less linear. There doesn't appear to be any correlation with carbon dioxide at all. Arctic sea ice increased from the mid-1950s until 1990. But something else really stands out in this graph. Look at 1979, where NOAA currently starts their sea ice graphs. It's right at the peak for the last century. By starting their graphs in 1979, they can show a sharp descent in sea ice since then. This graph shows the summer and winter cycles of Arctic sea ice extent, and today it is perfectly normal. And of course the trend line here is the red line. No alarm needed on this, is there? 